So I grew up in Sturgeon Falls. It's 6,400 population in between North Bay and Sudbury is situated. My father was the bank manager. And he truly believed in people who had, were honest and hardworking and put the effort. Um, and I think that's part of the values that he, uh, he inculcated in me. Um, and my father, I, I'll always remember that. I was probably 15 or so. and he, he didn't talk much in that way. But he had told me, just be true to your heart. And I've, I've always remembered that, that whatever you do in life, it, it, it's sometimes not obvious uh, which direction you should go, but you should try to be true to yourself. Um, but when you look at the mirror in the morning, you're the one facing what you see in the mirror. Uh, so uh, that is the, what I take from my, my father. Uh, my mother had a wonderful approach to life. And what I remember most from her, they're both deceased now. But she would say, let's cross the bridge when we get there. And that, there's a lot in that, and I've remembered that often along my life, because quite often you never get to the bridge, so why worry about it? Or there is no river when you thought there would be one. Fast forward, I was in my third year of a four-year program at Carleton University in experimental psychology, and I, I thought maybe that's not what I want to do. Um, I spent a lot of time in labs with pigeons and rats. <laughs> I, my partner liked to handle the animals, I did the calculations. Uh, but I, I thought, do I really want to go into that field? And I thought uh, at that time, it was close to exams at the end of my third year, that law might more be what I'm looking for. To, ha to deal with people, to human problems, and to try to find a practical solution to their problems. When I left law school, my uh, intent was to go into private practice in a small to medium law firm, if you will, and develop a practice of uh, corporate, commercial, real estate, certainly not litigation. Um, I had done, what, a few legal aid things at, uh, at law school. I had participated in a moot court, quite enjoyed it and did well in the moot court. But for some reason, I, I kept thinking litigation is not what I want to do. Um, um, I'm basically a shy person, perhaps. <laughs> the highlight of my career as a barrister was uh, my time as a, an assistant Crown Attorney. It, it truly was. It, it, it's probably a factor of the work is exciting, it's um, very interesting. And at that time in my career, that's where I would put the, the learning curve. It was at its steepest. <laughs> and that's where I learned the most. And it was, it's a very busy life. You're in court every day. You deal with real people. I come back probably to what I was looking for. You deal with real people who uh, have some problems. And you can bring the tools that you have and try to... Um, you can't always fix the problem, but you, you try to help out. In, in, in any way you can. So the, clearly that w those were the best, uh, the best years. I find that quite often those cases that people have identified, oh my God, you must have lost sleep. I, I didn't. <laughs> those are not cases that I have uh, lost sleep over from a legal standpoint, it, it, often it's not a difficult call to make. It becomes, um, well, perhaps not so much moral courage as integrity, moral integrity and honesty. This is where all this case that you have before you is leading. What cases did I have to struggle with and what cases caused, caused me to lose sleep? I'd have to say far too many. <laughs> um, it's, um, it, they are difficult questions uh, that we have to deal with at the Supreme Court, and I think it was, it's more the type of case where you can't, uh, you have trouble finding how the pieces of the puzzle fit. All right, it could be an evidentiary issue, and you want to make it all fit. And it's I've struggled a lot, and it's not necessarily just those that you are writing. It's a collegial court, and we all participate in the deliberation process. You can spend days. Um, struggling with the analysis that your colleague has written in trying to find out what's wrong with paragraphs 12 to 18 here. I can't put my finger on it. Um, so there have been lots of cases where the struggle is um, trying to find uh, the solution or those that where it's not 
quite clear what will be the consequence. I think you, you have to be cognizant of um, public opinion, including the criticisms that uh, uh, may arise from a case, but it cannot be the litmus test on, on how you're going to decide a case. So you have to, to build a certain immunity to that, not immunity, but a tough skin. Um, and if you have, you may be wrong in the result that you've arrived at or the decision that you have made. Um, but I, I welcome criticism because we learn from it. What I'm, I'm grateful for is that it rarely becomes personal. You don't have personal attacks. That, I, I think I would have had a difficulty accepting that. Like, uh, attack my opinion. You don't have to attack me as a person. Uh, I kind of don't think that uh, I am my opinion. I have made decisions in, in the context of the law based uh, on the evidence that is before the court and uh, uh, I've tried to do arrive at the best decision in good faith, so that, that I find it difficult. But it's not. I think that in general the media is very, very respectful of the of the individuals who make uh, those decisions and don't criticize at a personal level. Well, I do think that the Supreme Court creates good quality judgments. People will not always agree with them, of course not. So are we in step with public opinion? That's a, a difficult question to answer because um, I guess it will depend which public you ask <laughs> and which case we're talking about. One thing that's obvious is that public opinion cannot be the litmus test. Having said that, I don't think that the court can operate, any court, can operate um, in total abstraction of, of public opinion. Um, it can reflect um, very important uh, uh, values and, and aspects of a problem. And, uh, and as well, um, our, our decisions have to, be, have to be palatable to a certain sense and it, to a certain extent. Um, and I think we have to explain well why we are deciding something. And uh, it may not attract um, favor from at least a faction of the public, but if it's understood why the court went that way, I think that makes it more like palatable as a result. So courts cannot operate in the oblivion of, of the reaction to it, because that's important to the rule of law. The decisions have to be such that they command respect. They don't have to command agreement. They have to command respect. And I think that's through whichever level of court. How did I manage to write a lot of majority? I yeah. don't know that because it, uh, it struck me when I read your article, Kristen, <laughs> the stats, because you don't set out to do that. I don't know. I guess it's just <laughs> a question of, of, of the time. I, I was on the court at a time where there were like-minded uh, people on how we should resolve these cases. Um, perhaps I was persuasive in some cases. <laughs> how you approach here, I think my, my um, it, it may be a factor in how you, you end up writing for the majority. I see the role of a, of a judge here. You are an individual, you give your individual opinion, but I see it much more as it's, it's an institutional um, exercise and the judgment of the court cannot be solely what you, uh, what, what you think or your opinion. You don't, you don't sign on or you don't write something that you don't agree with. But um, let's face it, if we had nine different directions on any problem, we would not be doing our job. What kind of guidance would that be? Um, so it, being part of the Supreme Court, you have to approach the task as a collegial task. And, um, and I, I strongly believe that when you put more minds than one, you will have a superior product. So I approach a problem that way. What, what is the best solution here? And what my colleagues think um, will all be helpful uh, because I think you get um, a more complete picture. So I do write to, to draw on the wisdom and the knowledge of the others. It, it struck me early on that we had been studying the same material, the same file, we'd heard the same submissions, and immediately when we stepped out, sometimes it's as if we were describing something else. And, uh, and I, I take like a coffee cup and I am describing this, uh, this object that has no handle. There is no handle, look! 
but of course I don't see the handle. My colleague does because the handle is on the other side. So it's sort of a, a simple analogy, but it's just as true, is it, that there is a handle um, as my view that there is not. And uh, it struck me how, how smart that is because people are on courts of appeal. Well, hopefully they are strong on the law, but not because they, they have this, this divine knowledge that they get, they're going to get the right answer, but putting all this effort together will be a better product. What we'd end up doing is describing what was before us in a more complete way, in a more accurate way. So this is more what I mean in terms of it's not diluting the product, but it is a collegial effort and you have to be open-minded to not just shut off the person who says there's a handle because you don't see one, because there may well be one. <laughs> and, and once you've taken that all into account, um, and, and, and perhaps if you approach the task that way, it is easier to, to, to gather more people who are with you because you are reflecting their honest, valid views. What I enjoyed most about judging um, here on the Supreme Court is what I'm presuming you're asking, because it's a different task in different levels of court. But here at the Supreme Court, I think it would be figuring out the pieces of the puzzle. As I've told you, that's the, those are the cases that um, uh, were more difficult or caused you to put, have to put more thought. But uh, it, that's what's most satisfying when you feel right or wrong, but you do think that, oh my, the puzzle is done. You put that last piece of the puzzle, um, and that was um, uh, what I, I really liked the most about, uh, about uh, the work on this court. So I'd wake up at two and not be able to get back to sleep, and, um, and I figured, listen, this is a job where you can never clear your desk. And as much as you say you're doing one thing at a time, it can get overwhelming, um, I have to work on clearing my mind. And uh, I got into meditation. I started to do meditation. I took a course, and I don't want to expand upon that or whatever, but it was just very simple exercises that would help in regaining that focus, that you give it your best, you deal with it, um, and then you let go. I purposely decided to reduce the number of hours that I was working. And I figured, well, I'll see where that leads. And oddly enough, I found myself way more productive because you can spend so many hours and you don't realize it, but you're just not producing, you're just too tired. So it, it's kind of silly that it takes you almost 60 years to realize that your brain might function better if it, you give it a rest once in a while. <laughs> I've never been involved in sports, uh, but I do insist uh, on doing the minimum. I enjoy yoga. I do have a, a treadmill at home, I have an exercise bicycle, and they are not instruments that just hold my clothes. I call that my torture room, and I force myself to go in that torture room because um, it has become, I've become convinced that I feel so much better if I do it. I'm, I'm feeling quite happy. There's, ab there's absolutely nothing negative, and I, I, I did want to, to leave um, uh, when you're still feeling on top of your game, if you will, and you're still feeling positive. Uh, and you have to be true to yourself again. Yes, that's what my father told me. <laughs> I'm 60 now, and I do want to live a life that is uh, at, at a more relaxed pace and, and, uh, and take more time to live in, in the moment. Because when you do have uh, more free time, you can discover interests that you don't even know you have. Um, and I'm um, just, come on a journey of discovery right now, and it's very exciting.